My name is Brianna Lennon. Um, I practice elections law, I practice civil litigation, and I spoke to this group earlier uh, last summer about the new changes to the photo ID law. And so today I'm going to be talking about some uh, things to keep in mind when you're registering voters, common questions that I've gotten and I know other uh, election officials have gotten about registering voters. And then also I brought the handout that the Secretary of State's office has for photo ID, so I'm going to do a little refresher on that too. Uh, but I would like for this to be as much question and answer as possible because there are usually um, a lot of you know, small questions that people have about, you know, I want to have a voter registration drive, but what should I do? I don't want to, you know, come afoul of any of the state statutes, and there are some that are a little tricky. So, um, first, I just wanted to uh, say that on the tables, and there may not be one for everyone, so just let me know if there, uh, if you do want one of these. But it's top five questions about voter registration and five things to remember when registering voters. So those should be on your table. Uh, you can um, email me or get in touch with Shemin uh, if you would like a copy of that. So the first thing uh, that most people want to know is when they're doing a voter registration drive, whether they're sitting at a table or whether they're knocking on doors, um, is there anything, is there any kind of uh, vetting process that they need to do? Um, if you look at the voter registration application, I don't have it on the, on the table, but the, the general voter registration application can be obtained at the county clerk's office or uh, online at the Secretary of State's website and print it off. The first questions are, are you a citizen of the United States? Will you be 18 years of age on or before election day? Both of those have to be checked, yes. It's not your responsibility as somebody that's registering voters to make somebody check yes or not. You are supposed to provide this form to them or direct them to this form and uh, let them fill it out accordingly. Uh, it does have a big thing on it that says this is under penalty of perjury if you lie for either of these questions because those are uh, Missouri constitutional requirements for you to be able to vote. You have to be a Missouri resident, a U.S. citizen, and 18 years of age by election day. Uh, so those are the big things. There's nothing um, that allows you to really vet anybody. You can't go out and say, we're only registering Democrats today, or we're only registering, you know, it has to be open to everybody. It has to be inclusive and uh, very nonpartisan in the way that voter registration is conducted. So that's, that's the first thing that I like to tell people when they're um, thinking about doing a voter registration drive. Uh, the second thing is, and this is the really important one, if you are giving a voter registration card to somebody and then you are accepting it back, you have to send it to the county clerk's office within seven days. I always recommend that you have to that you do that by um, setting a calendar deadline or appointing one person in, in your group to do that and by bringing them in person to the county clerk's office. There's uh, postmark deadlines and things like that that you can abide by. It has to be set in a certain time. Um, but especially if you're in an area in Boone County that's close to Columbia, I always play it safe and just bring the voter registration cards directly to the county clerk's office so that they can't be lost. Um, sometimes, too, if you know you're going to be doing a very large voter registration drive and then collecting them back, uh, both the Secretary of State's office and, and sometimes the county clerk will make uh, a note that you have a large portion of them so that uh, if they have any questions for you after you bring them back, um, they can kind of keep track of those. The third thing that uh, that's important, along with that seven-day requirement, if you are being paid or compensated for soliciting voter registration cards, that usually does not come into play if you are sitting at you know, a Missouri Democrat table or a Neil Skinner's table uh, because those are volunteer things. But if you work for a nonprofit or you work for a business and the business or the nonprofit that you work for decides to have a voter registration booth somewhere um, and it's on company time, then uh, you have to register with the Secretary of State's office as a voter registration solicitor. 
It's a very easy form. It's on the Secretary of State's website. It just, it literally says your name and your address. It's the same if you've ever circulated a petition before and uh, prior to 2016 had to fill out a circulator information form. It just is an accountability and tracking measure. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to get any official designation or have it notarized. It's just so that people know if you're a paid voter registration solicitor, um, somebody in the Secretary of State's office can contact you if, for whatever reason, somebody calls and complains about something that happens. Be mindful of voter registration deadlines. That's really important as well. In addition to that seven-day requirement, keep in mind that voter registration deadlines are always the fourth Wednesday before the election. So you may be receiving voter registrations and you may be abiding by that seven-day deadline, but if you're registering voters two days before the uh, voter registration deadline and you think, well, I still have five more days to get it to the clerk's office under the seven-day law, you will still have people that aren't registered to vote because you've missed the deadline. So if people are entrusting you with voter registration cards, make sure that every voter registration card you have that's close to the voter registration deadline gets to the county clerk's office. Um, if someone is asking you about it, if you're not accepting them on somebody's behalf, but you are um, handing them out and they say, well, when do I have to get this back by? Remind them of the voter registration deadline. And that's on here, um, on the back page, it has the election dates and the corresponding registration deadlines. So if you're gonna be registering for the municipal or the primary of the general, keep those dates in mind. Remind people when you give them a card, it needs to be postmarked by that time. So all they have to do is drop in the mail by that date, but make sure uh, that they're aware that there is a deadline. Fifth, um, you may encounter people that are already registered to vote. You may be you know, talking to people that say, well, I'm already registered, uh, but I have moved. And if they've moved within the county, A, that voter registration deadline does not apply to them because as long as you move within the county, then you're still considered a registered voter. So that's a change of address. You use the same form, you use the same system, um, but that deadline no longer applies. But make sure that they fill something out to update their information. Uh, you can do that all the way up until the election, even on election day. If they change their name, same situation. And here's another big one, too, that I've gotten a lot of questions about, and that is really on the rise as an issue. States like Florida um, have had to deal with it pretty often. And that's what happens if my signature's changed. So if you're voting absentee, you have to sign your absentee. If you're signing petitions, you have to sign your signature on that. If you registered to vote in 1992 and you're signing a petition in 2018, your signature probably does not look the same anymore. If you have any concerns about that, if something has happened um, you know, to cause your signature to change or it's just changed as a consequence of time, um, fill out a new voter registration form. Uh, that's the best way so far from talking to other election officials to keep those things updated. Because that's always a, a big concern is, well, what happens if my absentee ballot gets thrown out because my signature doesn't look the same? It's still me, I'm still the same person. Um, try to, uh, to get people, if you're talking to them um, and they say they've registered but they, ha they haven't updated their registration in five, 10 years, have them fill out a new form. Um, it's a duplicate one, but then at least the clerk's office will have the new signature on file. Yes. Is there a box to check that I'm updating my signature or anything like that? No. Okay. Um, the only forms that, the only check boxes on the forms are new registration address change or name change. Okay. Um, they don't really have to pick any of those. It's just kind of a coding thing to keep track of. So whichever one they want to choose, they just have to fill out a new one. And clerks are always used to getting duplicate voter registrations because they get you have them at the DMV, you get them at the Department of Social Services, they sometimes have five or six copies of the same voter registration. On the name change, would that include people that get buried? Yes. If, you, if you're changing your name, that applies to anybody that has changed it because of um, marriage. If they uh, are LGBTQ, that's a big one that comes up. Um, 
if you yeah if you've been divorced anything that is related to to changing your name it's always good to keep it as up to date as possible yeah i thought i saw them so those are the five um five things that i want to impart on, on everybody as kind of the, the things to keep in mind if you're conducting these because voter registration is a big responsibility and it seems like it's a um an easy thing that you can just do and it is but if you're taking responsibility for taking on the voter registrations then that's something um there are things to keep in mind so the five questions that i have gotten most often about voter registration is how old do you have to be to register to vote and this is tricky because you can be 17 and a half to register to vote but you can't vote until you turn 18. so if you're 17 and a half and you register to vote and an election happens before you turn 18. Although you are technically registered to vote, you can't vote because you're not 18 yet. So there's a lot of, um, the Secretary of State's office often sends voter registrations to seniors in high school. They pre-register. It just makes sure that people are already on um, the voter roll before they turn 18. And uh, that way, when they become 18, if they, miss a deadline or something like that they're still already registered to vote and ready to vote the second one can convicted felons register to vote and this is the one um that is most often confusing and, and not everyone knows they can you have to have completed your sentence which includes completing your parole or your probation which is um, being considered off papers so you're eligible to vote again once you have completed that the only exception to that is if your felony was related to voting. So if you were convicted of voter fraud or convicted of something related to initiative petition fraud, then you will never be able to vote again. Um, but you, you can if you have a different kind of felony um, once you come off of that. I always encourage people to, uh, if they're unsure if they're reinstated or not, either call the clerk's office, fill out your new voter registration. They don't technically have to, but it's um, it's always good just to make sure. Because I used to get calls on election day where people would say, "Well, I'm not I'm not a felon anymore, but I'm not on the poll register either. So what's going on?" And sometimes it's because of the date and you've gone inactive, and so you don't show up on the voter um, poll book anymore. Um, so if you encounter anyone that has any doubt, have them fill out any voter registration form. Can college students register to vote? That's particularly um, specific to Columbia. Yes, you can register to vote at your place of residence. Missouri's law is based on what you consider your residence to be. So if you consider your college address your place of residence, you can register at that address. Um, the other nice thing, because Missouri has a full statewide voter registration database, if you are registered to vote in St. Louis County and you go to Columbia College and you register to vote in Boone County, St. Louis County will get the flag that you've registered to vote in Boone County and so you will not be double registered. That's one of the advantages of having a statewide system. Um, so that's that's good to know. If anybody ever asks, you know, well, do I have to call and cancel? Yes. If they're from another state, there are some um, data matching things that the state engages in that tries to do that, uh, but it's not automatic like it is for within the state. So if there are concerns, they can call their local election authority in the other state and go through the process of deregistering there if they want to. Yes? What if uh, you're talking to a college student <clears throat> They're not sure where they want to vote. Well, <laughs> that will depend on where they consider their residence to be. So, I mean, if they're like from Louisiana and they're going to school at Lincoln University, do then I say to them, well, you're going to need to choose before you register to vote? Yes. Or, right. Yes. If you if somebody says I don't really know where I want to register to vote, you can tell them that the law here is based on residency. 
So wherever they consider themselves a resident of. So if they're from Louisiana and they live in Jefferson City and they say, well, I consider Louisiana to be my permanent address. That's where you know I care about issues and that's, you know, I have an address there, I still get mail there and things like that, then that would mean that they are not eligible to register to vote in Missouri. So they just need to make their mind. They can't be yes. registered to vote in both places and decide on election day no. where they're gonna vote. Yeah, right. no, they have to be, because you can't have dual residences under Missouri election right. law. Right. Yes. <laughs> but a college kid could, like if they're like a senior who graduates in May, could vote, they could be registered to vote in Columbia because they consider Columbia their primary address until they graduate. And then they graduate and they move back home to their permanent address and they're not going to be in Columbia anymore. They can switch yes. for so like an August primary and they can re-register back at home. Yes. So some states have a residency time requirement. Missouri does not. Um, so if they are from out of state, it may be something that they want to look into. Um, because if they do, if they're registered in Missouri and then they leave in May and they go back home and their home state is not Missouri, uh, they may want to look into whether there's a residency uh, timing issue. But in Missouri, yes, you can register to vote in Columbia in May, move two months later and register to vote in your new residence. Um, and like I said, because of the voter registration database, it'll cancel out the Boone one. So wherever you're moving in Missouri, you will only ever have one uh, voter registration. Brianna? Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that it's not illegal <coughs> to be registered in two places. It is illegal to vote in two places. Is that correct? Yes, because there isn't a way to verify all the time that you're in both. But if you're claiming that you have Missouri residency and you don't, that that is a problem. <coughs> Yes. Is there a process that the, that someone would have to go through to claim Missouri residency? No. no. Um, resi residency is where you where you reside. Um, it's a subjective. There's there's a lot of case law. Yeah, there's a lot of case law about it and whether you're a resident is different under the law based on driver's license law versus candidate qualification law versus Missouri voter registration law. Um, but the where you have a permanent home, or not a permanent home, but where you reside is where you reside. That's, it's, yeah, it's really clear. Yeah. That's, that's true for voting, for reasons of voting, but for, for example, like tuition, that kind of thing, university can have different rules. Yes. 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 And that's the. That is the, the challenge of residency. Um, voter registration has probably the broadest way of defining residency. So um, that's something, I'm glad that you brought that up. It's something to keep in mind when you are registering college students, if they have in-state tuition or out-of-state tuition, um, those are things that might affect them. Um, if you're registering to vote, uh, if they live out state and they register to vote in state, then that's something that the university looks at as a way of determining whether you're eligible for in-state tuition. So that's something to keep in mind too. That would be a benefit for the student, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Candy. It's not sufficient. If they want in state, that's what they Any other questions after that? Yeah. The ID thing. Um, if they like you said, Louisiana is their home, but now they reside here and they consider this their residence, but they still have the Louisiana ID. Is that going to be okay? Or do they have to get a new Missouri ID? That's a good segue into my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I planned it that way. <laughs> yes. Well, when I remember my election training to be a judge here, the question, I'm, at least I was trained to ask, was where do you live? Yes. Not what do you consider your residency. So, I mean, to me, to, to make it clear to people, I say, so where where do you go to bed at night? But what you're saying is that's not really right, that they might consider their home as the primary residence because that's where they get the mail or something. 
It's yes. I mean, if you're if you're saying where do you live, a college student that you know lives at home over the summer may consider that their residency. Yeah. And that's why college students can be registered in St. Louis County and be going to school in Columbia. Well, so I think, I think the question I was trained to ask probably wasn't quite accurate. <clears throat> well, it's not. It's because it's so subjective for. Um, college students and military, the two times it comes up, um, mm -hmm. for the vast majority of people, yeah, where do I live is, is the clearest way of asking, but it's not technically encompassing everything that goes along with residency. Yeah. Yeah. Before you get into um, the specifics of the residency requirements, um, I just wanted to ask you on the, uh, in particular, on the signature vote, you know, yes. or, or people compare the signatures. How often in the state of Missouri have voters have votes been thrown out because signatures were not the same? So there's no data on that. Okay. So it's hard to say. You can tell from initiative petitions if they've gone to litigation. Um, you can tell, and if you ever sunshine the Secretary of State's office to know how many signatures were thrown out versus how many were counted, then you could find out how many those were. Um, but there isn't, there isn't really data um, that's easy to get to. There's a, there's a survey, there's an EAC survey that the state is required to fill out at a very high level of how many total absentee ballots that come in. Um, and all of the clerks in the, in the state fill out surveys that have that information on it. So they say, how many absentee ballots did you get and how many did you count? And sometimes they keep track of why they didn't count, and sometimes they don't, and so it's not always 100% positive. And sometimes they're thrown out because there's no signature at all. Um, so if there isn't anything that drills down to the level of saying, I don't think this was the same person. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is this a legitimate fear or concern that especially with people as they get older, you know, I notice even my signature yeah. sometimes is so it's, it's something that kind of goes around election circles. So Florida's got a um, proposed piece of legislation that requires uh, supervisors of elections to get updated signatures from folks because that they feel it's a, it's a concern. It's something that hasn't really been talked about in Missouri. Um, but I have gotten the question occasionally, especially for um, um, people that are, you know, going out to nursing homes and things like that. Okay. Yes? It's a really last year write-in ballot, right? Because I think it, you know, on the iPads, most, I'd say 99% of the people who sign those iPads do not have signatures that match what they have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. When they're checking signatures, what they check them for is the absentee ballot, the initiative petition, and then under this new law, there's a new kind of provisional ballot um, for photo ID. And that is a signature verification as well. Okay, so you would have to sign mm -hmm. that one the same way you signed it before. You're, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Is election fraud an issue in Missouri? <laughs> 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 no. For photo ID, no. Not to say for photo ID. Republicans <laughs> claim it's widespread and therefore they need legislation to restrict people voting. I have not seen any evidence of widespread voter fraud. Photo ID law. So it changed in uh, 2017, took effect in 2017. So, so far there's only been a few elections it's been in effect for. Um, and I will say, so the Secretary of State's uh, documents that spell out what it is are very clear, because what it basically did was create three tiers of uh, photo identification um, that you need to show when you come to the polls. So the one, the, the way that the law is written, the one that you can show 100% of the time, have no problems with, get a regular ballot with, um, is a government issued photo ID. So if you have a Missouri driver's license, a non-driver's license, a military ID, a passport, um, any of those things that are considered traditional photo IDs, that's just a regular, I show up with an ID. Um, the second tier is everything that used to count as an ID in the regular law, 
um, with the addition of having to sign a statement that says, under penalty of perjury, I do not have a photo ID. So that includes things like voter registration cards, um, the ID cards that you get from the clerk's office when they're verifying and canvassing you, IDs from universities and colleges, vocational schools, the utility bills, the bank statements, the things that um, government checks, things that are considered <coughs> other government documents that have your name and address on them. So those things, um, Wendy integrated into the, the iPad system, so anyone that's in Boone County knows when you go to the polling place, you sign on the iPad. So if you are showing a different kind of ID, um, it will flag it in the iPad system, and there will be an additional sentence at the bottom that says, I, I swear under penalty of perjury that I don't have a photo ID. The Secretary of State's office has made the determination, said it publicly, said it multiple times, that what that statement means to him is that you do not have a photo ID on your person. So if, you're, uh, if you've lost your um, driver's license, if you've been, um, if it's expired, uh, if you left it at home because you were walking to your polling place and you just forgot your wallet, uh, but for some reason you're carrying a utility bill, <laughs> it's fine, you can do that. <laughs> I know that's been one of the major concerns is, you know, I'm signing this is a very weighty statement to say under penalty of perjury. I'm swearing that I don't have this when you know that you have a driver's license at home. Um, so you can do that. Uh, you can also just go home and get whatever it is. Uh, it's kind of up to you. But there have been, um, I know, in other municipalities and jurisdictions where they've had special elections, that's happened. Nothing has happened to that person. Um, except that I think they get one of these flyers in the mail after the election because the secretary wants to make sure that those people are aware of the new law. Uh, the third option, which is the new option uh, that adds a new kind of provisional ballot, is if you have no ID at all. So um, if for whatever reason you don't have an ID and you show up at the polling place, um, You'll, if you're registered to vote, you're supposed to be on the poll register anyway. So if they find you and you're getting checked in and they say, all right, where's your ID? And you say, I don't have one. They give you a provisional ballot. It's not the same kind of provisional ballot that's been traditionally understood under the law. It's a new class of provisional ballot. So this provisional ballot, I like to say it's most like an absentee ballot because it's, it's the same questions, it's the same ballot as everybody else, but it gets put into an envelope that you sign. And then when it gets sent back to the clerk's office, under the law, the people that are um, tabulating and, and checking all of the uh, ballots are supposed to check whether your signature on that provisional ballot matches your signature on the voter registration database. So as long as you're registered to vote, and that's why the Secretary of State's um, tagline for this is, if you're registered, you can vote. As long as those signatures match and you show up on the, the voter registration database, then that ballot counts, just like any other normal ballot, absentee ballot. Um, so that's a new provision that hasn't existed before uh, that I always like to remind people about because it, it scares people sometimes to think of voting provisionally because there has been so much um, public concern about provisional ballots not counting. and. So this is a new form of provisional ballot. So do they have software to do that checking, or is it just an arbitrary guess by person? <coughs> checking for whether you're registered? No, check to see if the signatures match. It's manual. So they'll they'll pull up your voter registration file. And yes, and that's how they do it for absentee ballots and initiative petitions. It's all subjective human checking. Because there is software. Yes, we have not used it yet. How long did they take before that count? Um, so after the election, they have two weeks to certify the election. So within that two-week timeline, that's when they're supposed to be, because military ballots can come back then too. So a military ballot might be postmarked in time, but they might not get it until the Thursday after the election. So all of that processing happens within that two-week timeline. So if there's a 10, 15 vote margin, that election really is finished. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, the election is never really finished until the official results come out after the board verification. Yes. I don't want to confuse the issue, but are there other 
types of provisional, provisional yeah. ballots in Missouri? Yes. yes. There is one other type of provisional ballots. And um, it's an odd one. I don't want to go into it too much because it is very confusing because there's a weird catch-22 where you vote provisionally if you um, think that you're registered. Right. And then if you go back and see that you aren't registered, then your ballot doesn't count. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a nuisance um, provisional ballot because you're getting it because you don't count, so it doesn't count, but you got it anyway. So that's why I try to remind people, this is not the provisional ballot that people think of when they're thinking of these, you know, well, somebody gave me this and I know it's not going to count. These ones are totally different. So if you're getting a provisional ballot based on not having an ID, it is under the law supposed to be processed and counted as long as you're registered to vote. So back to your question about what the ID has to have on it. So if you um, think about when you go to the polling place, the uh, election judge is supposed to ask you to confirm your address. So you confirm your address, it doesn't matter what's on your um, ID for that because you have to verbally, well you don't have to verbally confirm it, but you're supposed to confirm what it is. Otherwise people that moved within the county would have problems too because everybody would have to keep their driver's license as updated as possible and we all know that's <laughs> impractical sometimes. It does have to manage what's on the registration. Which, I mean, what they say is there. Yes, address. what you say is your address has to be what's on the voter, um, the voter. Not on your driver's Yeah, on the on the <coughs> precinct roster when you walk in, that you have to have the right address on there. But you can up until that point, if you moved within the county, you can change your address right then. Um, so for anybody that's concerned, if they moved the day before the election down the street. Uh, it may change where your polling place is, so you might still want to call the county clerk and say, you know, has this changed where my polling place is? But in terms of uh, updating your voter registration, you're not disqualified just because you moved the day before. Yeah. And um, would you clarify for folks in the room that when you um, are confirming your address and your name, that you do not have to? say that verbally out loud for the entire room. Yes, it does not have to be verbally confirmed. Even though they're going to ask you, they're going to say, what's your address? You can ask to see it on the paper and confirm it. Yeah. And that was one of the, um, that's often a question because there's, uh, there's a safe at home program that uh, a lot of voters that are victims of domestic violence or um, for you know have a stalker or something like that have opted into this program so that their address is confidential uh this is to it the verbal requirement is often easy and it's easy for election judges to remember but it is not required you don't have to say your address out loud i just show my id with the address i point to the address on that id because i don't like to say that loud. that's a good way to do it too if your address is the same on your id you can just say this this is what it is Let's see. And kind of already went over it, but the deadlines, um, the thing to keep in mind is the fourth Wednesday before the election is the deadline if you're a new registered voter. Um, Will you give out the, uh, uh, I don't have the sheet in front of me. Will you just say verbally when the next? I can, yes. So if you are uh, interested in voting in the April election, that that is on April 3rd which makes the registration deadline March 7th. So if uh, somebody is moving in from out of state, that's a new registration. If they have never registered to vote before, that's a new registration they have until March 7th. If you're accepting uh, voter registrations on behalf of, of somebody else, I, I usually say get everything that you have the day before to them just to make sure that nothing is, uh, nothing is out of place and um, we've had situations, when I was in the Secretary of State's office, we had situations where outside organizations would provide these large packets to the Secretary of State's office. That's another thing. Don't send anything to the Secretary of State's office. They have no authority to register you to vote. The only thing that will happen is they'll put it in an envelope and then send it to your county clerk. 
and that will delay when you get your registration process. Um, so make sure that everybody knows if you're handing it to somebody and they're going to mail it themselves or if you're going to bring it out somewhere, do not send it to the Secretary of State's office. They do not have registration authority. Yes. If you are a resident of Boone County, but you want to have a voter drive in like Calloway County, do you need to get different uh, registration forms, or are it, they all the same? Um, they are technically all the same, but some county clerks like to, uh, you know, they put coding on them or things like that for their own system. Um, so if you're going to go to a different county and register, I always think it's good practice to just give the clerk a heads up and say, you know. I'm going to be in your area. I'm not from your area, but is there anything specific that I should know? Because they may have um, little things that would make your life easier that you might not know about. Um, oh, the other, speaking of that, the other thing I wanted to point out is there is online voter registration. There's a form on the Secretary of State's website that you can fill out uh, if you're doing that. Um, the only thing, if people have concerns about their signatures, sometimes that can be a little tricky. Uh, and then Boone County also has a uh, kind that you can use on your iPad if you go to um, use that. And I still like to do paper copy. That's, that's what I prefer doing, but uh, they, they are available. And if you do it online, do you, does the county clerk send them a paper and they have to sign it? No. You sign online. You sign online. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. This is a, a question that we sometimes get, like working in Boone County headquarters. On election day, you get calls from people who are confused. And there'll be like a, a student say who has moved and says, I want to vote. I don't know if I'm registered to vote. Or I've moved. And it seems to me that. <coughs> we had some we had some instructions there. It seems like the county clerk allowed you to go online and check where a particular person was registered and what their precinct voting precinct would be. Yes. So if they give you that information you can help them through that way. Yes. And then they say, But I don't live there anymore. I usually tell them go ahead and vote there anyway. That's a little tricky yeah. because if that's not where they live, there are um, there are provisions in the law that are very, I don't think they come up too often, um, called the interstate or interstate or new resident voter, things like that, that pertain to the deadlines. Um, but the, uh, if they've moved and they've moved in Boone County, yeah. and they've admitted that they have moved, right. then it is not a good idea to let them do that, just because they've, they've already admitted to you that that's not their residence. So, so they need to go to the precinct of the resident where they live now and then ask to vote but they can't they can update their precincts yeah. they can update their address at that and at they the can new, vote there. at yeah. the new precinct yes so okay. if somebody's new well, going that to the, sounds all right going to the new precinct is the, the best way to do it because that ensures that they get the right ballot style too exactly. because they, they may be in a different <laughs> region now. that's right they may be going for different um, local official okay so tell them instead they say well i'm not there anymore i've moved so let's find out what, what where there's oh boy that's difficult to do when you're sitting there in the office it where is. should they be voting no you can type in their address type the in their address yeah. and they'll tell you and yeah. then tell them go there and change yeah. their address to vote yeah mm -hmm. yeah oh, and just tell them that in the, in the future they should plan ahead <laughs> It's hard to vote in my country. You know, it's it's not easy. Yes. Is that advice required or after? Yep. <laughs> Emily, Brianna, can you explain the secret of the Central One polling place? Oh yeah. <laughs> there is that. For everybody in the can vote. Yeah. yeah. So if you um, have some people there. Boone County does have a central counter, and they are required under the law to have a central polling place and that polling place is the government center it's the clerk's office and uh, if you want to vote absentee you can go there if you want to vote in person um, it's also there so that 
if you have problems at your polling place, if you show up at your polling place and it's not accessible to you, and you um, don't want to do a curbside ballot, which is a, an option too, you can go to the government center and you can vote there. And they have a system where you, where they have every ballot style available. So it doesn't matter where you live in Boone County, you can go there and and cast your ballot on their central panel. Good question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to comment that the League of Women Voters has a packet of information for felons about how to get their, be sure that their voting rights are reinstated. So if anybody needs that, we'll be happy to share copies of that. There is a process by which they can get an affidavit when they're released from pro probation or parole. And then if they take, if they have not previously been registered, but they want to register, they can take that affidavit that shows that they're clean. Yes. As a system. So Are those in documents online. Um, I don't. They're not online via the League of Women Voters. But are you aware? Of well, so I will tell you. For the state level, they get um, data matches through DOC, and they're supposed to say who's on and who's off because otherwise they wouldn't know to take somebody off in the first place. So they are, they are, yeah, right. The taking them off is the tricky part because they are supposed to do these data matches. Every local election authority is supposed to do that to make sure that they're as up to date as possible on the status of their voters if they've been marked as a felon. So um, I am not sure about whether a, per a particular person's documents are on there. I and mean, the case net's available, so you can look them up. No, I meant her, the document, the, the affidavit that they would fill out and mail in. Oh. The, those are available online. And the packet, so we can download it. We can talk to the I will it. take that suggestion back to the week. Okay, thank you. Um, and would you just, uh, just in case someone in the room is not aware of what the curbside um, <coughs> ballot option is, could you just explain like, Sure. So if you go to your polling place and you are not able to get into your polling place for whatever reason, um, or if you, for whatever reason that, that you're not able to get in, um, then you can have uh, either somebody that has, has driven with you, most often somebody drives with you if that's the situation. You can have that person, you can pull up to uh, as close as you can get to the polling place and have somebody go in and tell the election judges that you want to do a curbside ballot. So you do all your check-in, you do um, your actual voting and everything done by election <laughs> judges that come out to you and uh, they keep it in the secret blue folder so that they can't look at it either and you fill it out and then they bring it in and they put it through the machine. So that's, that's an option for people if they, um, they want to use that. There's also a permanent absentee list. Yeah. So if you are... Um, uh, if you know that you're always going to be absentee because you either live in a nursing home and you have trouble um, getting around, there's a, a number of different requirements that you have to meet. But you can ask to be put on this permanent registry, this permanent absentee list, and they will always send you a ballot, no matter what. You don't have to do a new request every election. You will get an absentee ballot uh, for every election once you're signed up for that list. You've done an excellent job explaining things, and you have these two pieces of paper that explain things. There's a third piece of paper on here. What's this all about? <laughs> I, uh, so while I, while I am an elections attorney and I did work in the Secretary of State's office, I'm also running for Boone County Clerk. So, information on the tables, there are written envelopes on the tables, and I am having my kickoff for Boone County Clerk for my campaign on February 22nd at Shakespeare's West from 5 to 7 p.m., um, and it would be great to see everybody there. Thank you. Thank you.